Okay. Ah. Thanks very much. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're, uh, we're, <laughs> we're glad you came down. I know it's a cold night and everything, and uh, we're uh, in California. This would be a catastrophe. <laughs> it's your heart of your souls in the East. Uh, we're in off the road. You know, the show has been on the road. We've been in Atlantic City, and we've been in California, uh, in Anaheim at the cable, Western Cable Convention. Uh, and uh, then we were in uh, New York. And then, of course, we were in uh, the Berkeley Auditorium, the School of Music. Uh, so you see, we're, uh, we're kind of unpacked here. And uh, uh, we're, uh, this is going to be a kind of a, a close show, and I really wondered what it should be about. And I settled on the idea of an American inventory uh, because uh, uh, it really comes down to who we are and what we've got coming. Or what did we do to deserve these candidates? <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, this is... This isn't much, but at least, the, you know, it's one place in Boston where you won't run into Alan Dershowitz. So, uh, they're going to talk about a couple of things tonight. One is the movies, and one uh, is the political scam. Everybody's asking me about it, although I think most people are bored by it. But by now, everybody expects me to uh, discuss it. Uh, you know, uh, there's a hot rumor in the press, especially the New York Times here, uh, the world's greatest newspaper, uh, as they keep telling us. Anyway, um, about Jim Baker allegedly saying something anti-Semitic. Now, you know, the, uh, Baker answered by saying he didn't say it, and then he was kind of hostile. He told the Times that he's been working around the clock for four years with Bush to bring peace to the Middle East. He said he never goes home. Many nights he doesn't go home. He sleeps on his desk and everything. So I was tempted, if I had Baker's ear, to say, you didn't have to do it for me. But uh, this guy, you know, Bush and Baker brought the Israelis into a real sucker punch. They wouldn't give them the, uh, the money for the settlements, and they said, you'll get the guarantee if you resubmit it in 120 days. And by that time, when they did, they told them to stop the settlements, and, of course, we'll control the election in, in Israel as a result. Um, Israel being... The only country in these peace talks, the only country in the Middle East where anyone has ever voted, you know, and we kid about voting here. A lot of us don't want to do it. And Will Rogers said, why vote for them? It only encourages them and all that. <laughs> but uh, this is really, this is really uh, uh, fascinating. You know, there was a story going around in, in Washington some time ago, you know, about uh, what the Commonwealth of Independent States has turned into in Russia. You know, Russia has a history of being anti-Semitic and... Uh, even though many of the people around Stalin, like Molotov, were Jewish, uh, basically, uh, the Jews were always viewed with suspicion there. It's an old, old story, especially when it was a religious country. And now there's a thing called Pami out there, which is a very, uh, uh, it's a lot like the Nazi party was in Germany in the 30s, the early 30s. So uh, <clears throat> this story was told to me by uh, Alexander Haig, of all people, who was the only one, you know, when the Israelis took out the Iraqi reactor, Haig was the only one at Reagan's cabinet meeting who congratulated them. Everybody condemned them. That's Reagan, especially Bush, the chief of staff, James Baker, even the cabinet secretary. So uh, the way this story goes, uh, there's no work in Russia and there's no food. And this fellow's home and he's grousing more and more, this Russian, about a, his lifestyle and the plight he's in. And all he does is go to palm yacht meetings and gripe, you know. And uh, he's becoming more and more paranoid. His wife is down uh, in a queue for food. And, of course, there's never any food. And if there is food, uh, those are occasions when there is. She can't afford it. So uh, she runs in and she says, I have some exciting news. They got a shipment of vodka at the state store. So let's go down and see if we can afford it. So they line up. And there's this mob there pushing old people out of the way in wheelchairs and beating each other up, you know, <laughs> widows and orphans notwithstanding, to get into the store. And the manager of the store comes out and he says, I'm a Russian, I've waited a long time for Yeltsin, and I can tell you now, he says, uh, he says, if there are any Jews here, I won't sell you any vodka, so you can leave now. So a couple of people skulk out of the crowd, you know, and uh, uh, the rest are trying to assimilate, of course. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> name changes and cosmetic surgery, never helps. So then, uh, so, uh, then uh, they wait about three or four hours in line, and everybody's getting restive and everything, and... Uh, 
the manager comes out and he says, this shipment's going to be much smaller than I realized, so the militiamen are going to hold you in check. But I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to let it sell to any Ukrainians or anybody from uh, Uzbekistan. This is for Russians, this vodka. So they stay out there till 9 o'clock at night, and finally the manager of the store comes out and he says, I opened up the shipment, and it's much smaller than I expected. There isn't any vodka, and nobody's going to get any. And these people start to leave, and uh, the unhappy Russian turns to his wife, and he says, the Jews get all the breaks. <laughs> so, something to think about. So, anyway. Now, uh, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about was, uh, uh, you know, our aims here at the Monitor Channel and how we got started. You know, we... Uh, we originally got started. We were only going to have Channel 68. We weren't going to have the Monitor Channel. And I was with the chairman, Jack Hoagland, one day, and uh, we were in a restaurant in a shirt in a hotel across the street, and a waiter came over, and uh, Jack was holding a paper, and he said to the waiter, isn't this exciting? Mandela finally got out of jail after 27 years. And the waiter said, what was he in for? <laughs> so uh, Jack said to me, we've got to get a news channel. You know, we've got to get something <laughs> where we can inform people. I said, well, you know, I don't know. So anyway, anyway, more of this later. So, meanwhile, George Bush has won, uh, has won all of these uh, uh, primaries. He says, 70% is a landslide by my lights. And I'm reminded of when Eugene McCarthy, who will appear later in the show, uh, Eugene McCarthy said, uh, uh, George Bush looks like the fourth man in any carpool, is what he had once said. So, uh, <clears throat> McCarthy also said when Bush said, why won't the Israelis listen to reason? McCarthy said the last time the Jews listened to a bush, they almost didn't get past it. So, you know, anyway. So, uh, if, if, if Buchanan's elected, he can uh, invade Israel. I'm head of, uh, of uh, uh, I don't know who would go with him, but that, that remains to be seen. I'm head of, uh, of Radicals for Buchanan in Berkeley, California. It's a new group. We're trying to recruit people. What else? He doesn't like, uh, he says, uh, Buchanan says, it's a terrible thing, you have to learn Spanish to get a driver's license in this country. I know it sounds xenophobic, but I'm sure he's a, a good guy. And uh, he's, uh, <clears throat> by the way, I, got, I just renewed my driver's license in Los Angeles a couple of weeks ago, and I, you know the organ donor part? <clears throat> I'm leaving my point of view to future generations. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, so, what else? This, uh, this convention reminds me, you know, I originally met Buchanan at the uh, Reagan convention in uh, 1980, uh, 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 where was it, 80, 84. I met Buchanan and he walked in and he was dogging Reagan's tracks. You know, Reagan isn't right enough for him. He talks about him now, Ronald Reagan. But uh, he wasn't like that then, Buchanan. He was very, you know. So uh, when he walked in, Reagan, who was given to jokes, said, uh, uh, take it easy, Pat, I've had a busy morning. And uh, Buchanan said, what have you done? And Reagan said, I declared war on Russia and we start bombing immediately. <laughs> and Buchanan didn't laugh. The rest of us did, you know. And he walked away mumbling something about promises, promises. <laughs> George, George, George Herbert Walker Bush. This is your conscience speaking, George. Mm -hmm. So who's left now? Uh, Bob Kerry, uh, who now finds out that Clinton is the frontrunner after avoiding service in Vietnam, is going to meet with Nixon tomorrow and give his medal back, I guess. And uh, <laughs> Tom Harkin is gone, which shows you how strong the liberals are in fidelity to a Roosevelt Democrat, which he claims to be. I don't know if he is. Who would know? And uh, nobody remembers what the value system is anyway. So that leaves uh, Songus, who's like... Uh, uh, Jesse Jackson after a lot of Thorazine <laughs> and, uh, and uh, boy and, uh, and uh, Bill Clinton Bill Clinton if he's the front runner he better start preparing now because uh, I don't want to say George Bush fights dirty that wouldn't be fair what can we say within the limits of the good taste he, uh, the Republican National Committee is recruiting young ladies that Bill Clinton hasn't even dreamed of yet <laughs> so I'm sure and uh, the uh, 
And Governor Brown, of course, who uh, I've kidded about in the past, calling him the, the first American in space, and uh, <laughs> uh, you know that he belonged to a Dominican order and took the vow of silence on the major issues. We talked about that. Yeah. <laughs> I was in New York with him at the Carter Convention. Remember how he shook up Carter? He won Maryland and all. He thought Carter had very shallow support in 76, and uh, Reagan was running around the convention saying, I, if I'm elected, I will put a, uh, a woman on the Supreme Court, and Governor Brown called his own press conference subsequently, and he said, that's nothing. If I'm elected, I will marry a woman. <laughs> it's just a hell of a commitment, you know, if you think about it. So uh, anyway, and Mario Cuomo, we hear nothing from because he's waiting for the presidency to be an, a point of office. <laughs> So I think we ought to go back and look into history. I want to talk to you about history a little bit. And fortunately, we have our 43-inch uh, monitor here off the road. You know, you notice that none of these candidates talk about the old days in the Democratic Party. I haven't heard Songa say, I want to do what Roosevelt did. I want, to, uh, I want to declare war on poverty and unemployment. He doesn't mention Roosevelt. He doesn't mention Stevenson. He doesn't mention Kennedy. It's like the comedians. You can't find a comedian in Hollywood who will mention Laurel and Hardy or Jackie Gleason or uh, W.C. Fields. I have a hunch. My theory is that they don't want to be compared to them and found wanting. These guys don't want to be compared to these people. A lot of people today uh, 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 wouldn't know uh, a lot about Roosevelt, as I said earlier. But uh, Roosevelt said, you know, what ailed the country was not only the people had no work, but they wouldn't be proud of what they're doing. So they built schools and they built bridges. The government was even in the theater business, the federal theater, which produced the playwright the Clifford Odets, and it produced uh, uh, actors like Burt Lancaster and Wendell Corey. And in addition, uh, when Roosevelt signed the bill creating the federal theater, he said, I look forward to the day in America when uh, art will be as common to the common man as bread, and bread will be as common to the artist as art. So, you know, that's the kind, that's the kind of leader you had. And, uh, and uh, 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 Roosevelt, uh, Ro uh, Roosevelt wanted the common man to become an uncommon man. That's what Pat Weaver wanted television to make him, by bringing you ballet and Richard III and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the Living Theater out of New York, which NBC did when Weaver was running it. So uh, that's a far cry from television today, as we'll get into later. So probably Roosevelt inspired Adlai Stevenson, whom I want to talk about for a minute. Can I see uh, Adlai Stevenson up there? There he is. It's a guy you don't hear much about, and I knew him pretty well. And uh, Stevenson said a lot of things, a lot of great things. He wrote all his own speeches, and he said, the frontier is wherever a man meets a new thought. He also said one day, success is wonderful, but don't inhale. <laughs> uh, at the 75th birthday party for... Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt at the Waldorf in New York, a dinner I worked with him. You remember he coined the phrase that Eleanor Roosevelt would rather light one candle than curse the darkness. And I thought about that uh, the other day. I was sitting with my friend Mark Russell, who's going to be in the Truth Squad in the next show. And when uh, Tom Harkin said, as soon as I'm sworn in, I'm going to issue every American a five-cent light bulb so that we can save 18% of our federal power. And uh, Mark said, everybody except Jerry Brown who wants to curse the darkness. <laughs> so, and uh, toward the end of his life, Adlai Stevenson said to me, probably the worst thing about life is that there's no one uh, to talk to. And uh, at the end of it, you know, he died of a heart attack walking in London. He came and stopped at the embassy for a night to break his trip from Russia into America when he was UN ambassador. And he walked with Eric Severide. He dropped dead in the sidewalk. And he said to Severide earlier, uh, he said, I'm tired of lying for the administration. And some of us don't think that uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis was his finest hour. But he was a loyal guy, and, uh, and uh, he held the flag up. So I think Roosevelt inspired uh, uh, Stevenson. And uh, uh, Stevenson uh, it probably inspired Eugene McCarthy, who shared some time with us uh, earlier. And we want to bring you a little bit of that now. I've been watching the Bush people rather closely, and several things, you know, George uh, doesn't like to use the personal pronoun I. Uh, Peggy Noonan in her book said that she started to write stuff for George when he was running, and they, they said, uh, we can't use your material because George doesn't like to say I. She said, in fact, he prefers to have no subject at all. <laughs> Just a bunch of predicates. 
got so up to say, I'm going to war. And no, the... he said, going to war. <laughs> and, and you don't know whether it's a question or not. I'm going up to inspect the, the damage in Maine to my home? No? No, he wouldn't say, I'm going. You would say, going. Uh, or, and Peggy in her book said they thought maybe when he took the oath of office, he'd say, do solemnly swear. <laughs> uh, so you don't know whether it's an indicative sentence, an imperative sentence, or a question. If you were going to do a book about the liberals, where would you say they went? Where did they go? Well, you have to watch things. Uh, if, if an adjective becomes a noun, mm -hmm. you're in trouble. Like liberal, when I got into politics, was a good adjective. You could be a liberal something. But progressively, it took on the attributes of a noun, and it became a noun. And once that happened, it was under attack. As they say, what kind of a noun? You remember the... And it has no defense. That's right. There's no one rising to its defense. It has defense, no adjectives. So you, so you can hang them on. And the conservatives started to hang adjectives on the word, on the noun liberal, like... Uh, Oh, what did they say? Uh, Pinhead liberal. And, and pointy headed. Pointy headed liberal. Donald Wallace. Egg -head point, liberal pointy and, headed liberals. And pseudo liberals and, and quasi liberals. And the caucus adjectives. ran from it, of course. That's right. And then, the, then the, the liberals started to qualify what kind of liberals they were. You know, I'm not a. Uh, the mayor of New York said that he was a sane liberal. <laughs> Oh, as distinguished from the rest of us, and, uh, and uh, I think Dukakis said he was a neoliberal, which was a different kind. So I was really in debate uh, with Rusher of the National Review, and he said, what kind are you? And I said, I'm none. I'm a pure neo. <laughs> All alone. Not a neoliberal or a liberal neo. Develop just a neo. An absolute neo, and I said I was going to hold that position for, I thought, seven years and hope that the word liberal might be rehabilitated. But the same thing happened to the goat. The, the go was the, the goat, goat missing? The goat in history started out as a useful animal, like the liberal adjective. Mm -hmm. And progressively the goat moved up until it became a deity and actually a constellation. And then it got into trouble. <laughs> and they sort of lowered it to kind of miserable revels. And finally it got down to being the name for a lewd old man and the guy that lost the baseball game. Yeah. The and the same goat. thing happens, really, if you make a noun out of an adjective, you have sort of deified it, and it, it isn't long before it begins to lose any effective power. <laughs> an Oscar for me? Why, I just don't know what to say. I just don't know what to say. I just don't know what to say. Now, you know, uh, this month, uh, the American Broadcasting Company will be bringing you the Academy Awards. That's the latest. And uh, I was thinking about the kind of movies we've got, you know, and I'm going to share some of, the kind, some of the ones we chose. You're probably tired of all of these now, but what have we got here? I mean, what have we got? The best picture of the year, according to many people, is a picture called Bugsy, about Bugsy Siegel. Uh, excessive brutality, and Meyer Lansky says somewhere in the film, he says... Uh, ben is a dreamer. He isn't interested in money. That's an American hero, uh, Bugsy Siegel. And we've got the Silence of the Lambs, you know, because Hollywood always, Irving Thalberg said the formula was to either scare the audience to death, make them laugh, or make them cry. Well, they can make me cry and they can scare me to death. They haven't made me uh, laugh in a, a kind of a humanistic celebration in, uh, in quite some time. But I started, uh, I started thinking about movies, and I couldn't get very excited about these movies. I don't want to put Oliver Stone through it again because... Uh, we did that, and that would probably be self-serving because uh, I was all involved in that one. But, you know, uh, I picked out three movies here I want to show you a little bit of that you never see. Now, one of these is called The Fifth Monkey with Ben Kingsley. Got no theatrical release, was made in Brazil. And uh, he plays a drifter in the Amazon who goes around and he kills snakes and sells them to the zoos or he sells them to naturalists or... People who want to mount them on their walls. He's like a lost soul, you know? And uh, he's walking around one day, and he, he meets four monkeys. 
and they kind of adopt him. And he wants to grab them, get friendly with them ostensibly, and then grab them and sell them to a circle, a circus, make a big score, you know, financially. Let me show you a couple of scenes from this. This is where he first tries to, the monkeys are friendly with him, and he tries to capture them to sell them. So the monkeys hang around with him. Thank you. And he, uh, he meets a girl. And he says, I'm going to sell the monkeys. And the girl says, she represents his conscience, as women often do in our lives if we're lucky. And he, she says, uh, you, well, how can you sell them? He says, because I captured them. She says, I think they captured you. you. The only reason you can sell them is because they trust you. And that's the reason you can't sell them. And he's getting a lot of guilt about it, but it's not incapacitating. And he comes down to the docks of Rio to turn them over to the guys for the circus. You knew I was going to do it. But you didn't leave, okay? Hey, you can leave now if you want to. I won't stop you. If you're sold, you may be working in the circus. Hey. Have a good time. I'll come see how you're doing. Then, of course, his conscience gets the better of him, and uh, he redeems them. In one scene in this picture, a bunch of uh, dilettantes are having a big dinner. These wealthy people in Brazil, and they're talking about depleting the rainforest. And one of the environmentalists at the dinner says, uh, you can't do that. The monkeys are sitting at the table. He says, you can't do that. And uh, the guy that's running the rainforest, sort of a Daniel Ludwig character, he's uh, ruining it, he says... Uh, well, nobody can see what we do here anyway. And uh, the environmentalist says, God is watching through the eyes of the animals. So you see, there's somebody reaching for something. And the movie plays on our values. This is about shared values. And I'm, I'm not going to play the rest of the movies yet. I want you to take a look at uh, some outtakes of an interview we did with Robert Town, who wrote, uh, you know, got the Academy Award for Chinatown. He wrote the Tarzan picture. And he wrote... Uh, uh, Shampoo, and uh, he writes all the Beatty Nicholson uh, uh, enterprises. Have we got town there? Good. You told me that uh, the pictures aren't very good. What I mean is that what I have seen, and I think what a lot of people have seen, is the loss of narrative in story. Film. Loss of story. Loss of the ability to tell a story. Loss S of maybe desire to tell a story. Story depends on what, for primarily? Well, uh, it probably depends on how much you love something, how much you hate something, and how much you care about it. And uh, it, it depends on passion, because it takes a, a lot of passion to fuel a narrative for two hours and, and keep it going and make you feel in the audience, gee, I wonder what's going to happen next. And in order to get that feeling, what you have to have is, is uh, a lot of feeling behind those characters, that, that what they're doing really matters to them. And uh, I think that that requires feeling on the part of the people who make them. What I'm interested in, Bob, is where the point is. In other words, 
if someone is writing a movie and they assume that it won't have any values because people don't have values nowadays, if they make that kind of a cynical presumption, as many people in the industry do nowadays, where do you get to the point of diminishing returns where you're shaping the audience and shaping it, and pretty soon it's shaping you? Well, I think we're at that point. Oh. Yeah, I didn't I notice. That, uh, we're so busy driving. I, I think that, that, I mean, if you, if you sort of consider uh, movies between the filmmaker and the audience a kind of dance where one partner leads and the other follows, w I think the film makers are now following what they think the audience wants. And I think that, I think you're always lost when you worry about what somebody else wants and you don't have a strong feeling yourself. Let's, let's take a look at a favorite of yours, Sergeant York. I, I feel I should say, I imagine most everybody knows this, but York was uh, the, probably the greatest, uh, most decorated hero in World War I. He was a, a conscientious objector. And, uh, he, and, and it was well known. And yet, uh, when push came to shove, he finally decided to fight. Uh, he went and uh, I think in the course of uh, battle killed uh, 134 or 138 of the enemy, knocked out several machine guns, won the Croix de Guerre, won the uh, Medal of Honor, had the national parade down uh, Fifth Avenue, a holiday declared by Congress, and is getting ready to go home here in Cordell Hull is speaking to him about what is being offered to him as a result of his Did you terrorism. say he was a conscientious objector? Oh, he was. Go. Are they offering that money because of what happened over there? Well, uh, that's it, ain't it? That's it. Take all the time you want to think it over. I've done thought it over, Mr. Hull. I ain't proud of what happened over there. What we done in France was something we had to do. Some fellows done it ain't a coming back so the way i figure things like that ain't for buying and selling so i reckon i'll have to refuse them would you be a telling them that for me please and tell them i'm a going home well it's amazing to, always to me to watch that that piece of film because of the, the conviction in it and and i remember seeing it as a kid and thinking being happy that he did it, but not being overwhelmed with shock that he did it, uh, that the notion that, that some things were not for buying and selling was a commonly shared notion by everybody in World War II. And it, it's, it, it isn't just uh, nostalgic, nostalgia for kind of uh, lost values. I mean, in talking about the loss of narrative power, it's, that it's a lot more efficient and a lot easier to tell a story when everybody has shared values. And, and at the time that this movie came out, I mean, most of the audience that saw this movie believed in God and they believed in country. In one permutation or another, there could be arguments about it. So the question was not, do I fight? And the question was not, uh, do I uh, uh, stand up for my country? Nor was, the, uh, uh, nor was uh, there any doubt that a man should abide by his religious convictions. But it was an age-old conflict. I mean, how do I serve God and how do I serve man? Or how do I serve the state? Uh, yeah. That's a conflict that is in Greek tragedy. It's in Sergeant York. And it was a relevant issue prior to World War II. And when you only have to make one choice and you don't have to explain to the audience, well, I don't know if this war is worth fighting or isn't worth fighting, or I don't know what I believe in God exactly when all you have to decide is, how do I serve two masters? It's one choice, and it becomes very dramatic. You don't have to spend a lot of time explaining to an audience what you're doing. It just makes storytelling more efficient. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's Robert Town, and uh, a really nice guy, you know, and uh, totally devoid of ego. I mean, really humanistic. We, uh, we got news just before we went on the air, you know, that a great friend of mine passed away tonight named Richard Brooks, a writer-director, who uh, gave you, uh, you know, Elmer Gantry and uh, the happy ending and uh, the professionals and Lord Jim and Deadline USA and In Cold Blood. A uh, real giant of a guy. And, you know, Brooks could do it with one sentence. When, they, when they're going to hang the two guys in cold blood, the guy arrives with a bag and the reporter says, who is that? They said, that's the executioner. He says, has he got a name? He says, we the people. That's Brooks. And uh, he was a, a, a singular light, you know. I mean, he was uh, uh, the guys that came out of the Marines, that, that group that came out of, 
in World War II, newspaper men, the Hemingway uh, tradition, great believers in America and great believers in the structure of movies where men took on a noble quest and were changed uh, in the process. Incidentally, you might look in your video store, a rather obscure item is called The Happy Ending with his wife then, Gene Simmons, and John Forsyth. It's a story about a woman growing and leaving her marriage, and her husband goes after her at the end of the picture, and she's going to night school. And he says, uh, come on back. And she's going up the steps of the school for a class. And he says, I love you. And she stops and she turns to him and she says, if we were just meeting and you knew what you knew now, would you marry me? And he hesitates. And everybody in that theater knew that they were lost. <laughs> just so Brooks is a great, great man and uh, we're going to be doing a lot of crying about that. One of the, one of the pictures uh, I want to show you now, remember I talked to you some weeks ago about Oliver Stone's movie and I said, even though I agreed with him, that being on the side of the angels was not enough. You had to dramatize the problem. A political movie should not just have uh, banners, uh, and it shouldn't just be agitprop, it should have people in it. The picture I chose for you is Ryan's Daughter, which is a picture about the Irish resenting the British, but it's got people in it. It's got Sarah Miles in it, an Irish girl who consorts with an English major, and everybody in the village beats her up and cuts her hair off, ostensibly because they hate the British, probably half that and probably another half that are envious of anybody that could find any kind of passionate happiness on this, on this forlorn uh, island. And it's also the fact that people are, people are generally looking for a victim to take out all their unhappiness on. But they're all people, and there are a lot of ironies in the picture. The real betrayer of, of the Irish cause, the IRA, is her father, a publican who is a spy for the British, and is thought of as an IRA officer. So uh, her husband is a school teacher in it, um, Robert Mitchum, and after they all banish her from the town and no one will speak to her, she's leaving, and the only ones that will walk out with her and help her carry her luggage, she and her husband, is the village priest, Trevor Howard, and John Mills playing the village idiot whom no one wanted to talk to, but suddenly the prettiest girl in the village and the village idiot are on the same par. They've got the same haircut, they're both limping, and they're both wondering what they were put on earth for. Well, let's just take a look. I have a parting gift for you, heroes. It's supposed to be a fragment of St. Patrick's staff. I don't suppose it is, though. God bless you, child. Come on now. Come on. Get on up. I'll help you load up. Thanks, Mother. Thanks for a great many things. Mm. Charles, I think you have it in your mind that you and Rosie ought to part. I thought as much. Well, maybe you're right, maybe you ought, but I doubt it. And that's my part and gift to you. That doubt. God bless. That doubt is my parting gift to you. That's Robert Bolt, of course. So you, the writers don't come any better than that. They don't come any better than uh, the David Lean. Look what he did. He took the most virile man we know, Robert Mitchum, and he plays uh, a husband who's humiliated by his wife. Trevor Howard, the hardest drinking guy in England at the time, plays the priest. Uh, John Mills, a great intellectual, plays the village idiot. It's all, you know, because it's all true and it's because it isn't enough to be political, it isn't enough to be virtuous. And finally, you know, if you think this is all an intellectual exercise, I said earlier the movie should scare you, they should make you cry, they should also make you laugh, and I think they've forgotten how to do that. Uh, you know, uh, you remember when Norman Cousins had the heart attack and he cured it through laughter, renting tapes? <laughs> I was talking to uh, Dean Hargrove, the editor of, uh, of uh, Perry Mason. He said to me, have you got an idea for a Perry Mason show? And I was writing at that time. I said, yeah, Ed, we ought to have a guy like Cousins who wants to cure himself through laughter and he dies in the hospital. He sends out for some tapes from Laurel and Hardy and uh, he dies. And Perry Mason investigates and finds out that at the tape store, they switched the tapes. Instead of Laurel and Hardy, he got Dan Aykroyd and Chevy Chase. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, here's a picture. 
that is just fun. And this picture is called My Name is Nobody. It's from 1971. It's Terrence Hill. It's a spaghetti western. And it's about, uh, this is just the fun of uh, uh, the big operatic, fun-loving style, the ballet, if you will, of the Italian directors. Notice how this guy clears his holster so fast his saddle won't drop. Turn around, you! You mean we gotta shoot it out? So you're Beauregard's friend. I wish I was. You know what they say? He could draw his gun three times before the other fella even starts reaching. Like this. Well, we gotta shoot it out. I'm ready. Well, uh, just a. Uh, hey, hey, you gotta admit, he did deliver the basket. Yeah, sure. And that son of a. Beauregard, he didn't want it. You're right. Guess you earned yourself a horse. That's, uh, yeah, Henry Fonda plays the marshal in the movie. This fellow rides around after him and he says, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? The marshal says, I'm going to retire. I've been exploited. I made 20 a month and got a thin star. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take advantage of corruption now. Got myself a nest egg. And uh, Terrence Hill says, you can't do that. You've got to give hope to young people. You've got to be a hero in, in history. And uh, he said, well, who are you to tell me this? He says, nobody. What he really is is his conscience again. And uh, conscience is a recurrent theme tonight. It keeps coming back to me. I, I'm making, uh, in this rare event that I listen to the show as I do it. Uh, did you ever meet anybody who wrestled with his conscience and lost? <laughs> Not lately. Now, you know. I just don't know what to say. I just don't know what to say. I just don't know what to say. Say thank you. What? Say thank you. Thank you. Uh, look what you had. You got you had Oscar Wilde. Now you got Gore Vidal. Look at the difference. I mean, you see what the difference? Humanity. Um, I was talking to a director named Sidney Pollack the other day. Sidney Pollack, of course, uh, directed Havana and Out of Africa and The Way We Were. Great love story director. Very gifted. Sidney just gave an address to the American Enterprise Institute. Do any of you know what that is? That's a, uh, a right-wing think tank in Washington. I think it's nothing but Ben Wattenberg at home, but they keep <laughs> insisting it's an institute. And they asked him to come in because they think movies stink and there ought to be censorship because America is ruining the world with its, its uh, uh, laggardly, uh, you know, sexual values and the lack of virtue in movies and so forth. So, of course, Hollywood, it's true, movies are bad, and movies have become uh, more permissive and less uh, adventurous. I wondered, uh, you know, how do you hold forth on that? Sidney didn't want to do it in a way because he, he, didn't, he thought he couldn't really talk to these guys because they're, they're political. They're worried about natives and people filling the stomachs of Russian people. Well, of course, artists fill the human heart. That's what their job is. Most of us nowadays are leading lives of such uh, desperation that we, the things we long for, we don't even dare to dream about. But when we do dare to dream, that's where the artists come in. That's, you know, when they can, uh, they can, they can put wheels under it. The question is, you know, with censorship, you've got to let a lot of bad guys through the door so that eventually the good guy can come through and do a good... Uh, a good picture. Besides, it's not censorship anyway that'll clean up the movies or literature or anything else. It's, it's conscience again. It's what you learned from your parents or what you learned at church or what you learned in school, that you don't do that kind of thing. That's in a, a movie or a book uh, by Mark Harris called Bang the Drum Slowly. You recall Robert De Niro is a ball player and he's dying of cancer. And a girl gets a hold of him and... Uh, she goes to Michael Moriarty, who's the pitcher in a team who sells insurance on the side, and she says, he's going to make me the beneficiary, and you can help me. He said, well, I can't do that. She said, well, he's going to die anyway, and the money's going to be paid anyway. What's the difference? And uh, 
Moriarty says it's true. It wouldn't cost anybody anything. And what is the difference? You can always do the wrong thing, but somehow you don't do it. I don't know why people don't do it. Maybe it's because they all know they're dying a little bit every day anyway, just a little slower than him. So what we do is we, uh, uh, under the grab bag, I guess whether you call it church or school or your parents, it's the thing that stopped American boys from going into Vietnam and burning civilians in a ditch. They may have done it a meal lie, but they didn't, they didn't uh, all do it. It seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? And you bring that up, it seems like, you know, really pretty strange. I mean, when you think about, uh, I mean, it's almost uh, obscure. You remember that, Lieutenant Kelly. Lieutenant Kelly, uh, he was uh, arrested uh, for massacring civilians. That was a charge. Richard Nixon, who was then the president, said, a little lesson in current history here. He said, uh, this man is an officer and a gentleman. I don't want him in the stockade with drunks and people that are AWOL. So take him out of the stockade at Fort Benning before his court-martial and put him into the Holiday Inn in Columbus, Georgia, <laughs> under house arrest. And they, he was in People magazine. He had a hot plate where he could make instant coffee and tang in the morning, living like an astronaut. And they, the Army allowed him conjugal visits from his girlfriend, which is more than a lot of married people enjoy in America, I guess. And uh, if you think about it. And then they tried him, and they sentenced him to death. And Nixon said, I want an appeal. And they moved him to Leavenworth Barracks. And he got there, and they put him, they put him in the stockade, and Nixon took him out of the stockade pending review of his sentence, presidential review, and he said, uh, put him into the Holiday Inn in Leavenworth, Kansas. So then Nixon got purged at Watergate, and the Army wanted to get even with him and assert their muscle, their clout. So they, uh, they got a hold of Kelly, and they reviewed the sentence a second time, and they found him guilty, and they sentenced him to live in the Holiday Inn for the rest of his life, <laughs> which the Supreme Court found to be cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> What do you make of that court? What do you think of that court? You want to talk about no shame in the Bush administration. Uh, Thomas doesn't think that a policeman beating a prisoner is cruel and unusual punishment. Yeah, and, and the liberals were worried about abortion. They were worried about abortion. It, it won't even get that far. It's fascinating, you know, what, what, uh, what you have here. This court, Rehnquist is saying they've got too much of a caseload. Souter isn't saying anything, which is probably we're breaking even there. But if you think about it, you know, William O. Douglas, who was the best they ever had on there, I think, he said, it's easy to interpret the Constitution. Every man could be a justice. You have to remember that the Constitution guarantees everybody's rights all the time, not just the people you favor at certain times. And uh, Douglas was pretty magnificent, you know. Roosevelt put him on there, and he was on there for, uh, for 41 years. So... Uh, the other day I heard Douglas referred to on the David Brinkley program, and uh, Brinkley said, Douglas never did anything on the court except run for president. I, I thought that uh, Brinkley was uh, better educated than that. George Bush, this is your conscience speaking. George. <laughs> Don't worry, Mr. President, it's just me, Dan Quayle, fooling around. Uh, anyway, by way of closing remarks tonight, you know, you, you do me great honor to come down. It's a real cold night, and, and uh, these are really improvised circumstances, and I'm awful, awful glad to see you, even though I outnumber the audience. <laughs> I want to say a couple of things to you, you know. Uh, uh, we never want to be self-serving on the Monitor channel, but I know a lot of you would like to ask me questions about all this stuff in the paper. Uh, I don't know anything about it. I, you know, I only, I only work here. Uh, but I'm human. Can you prove that? And not at the moment, but uh, uh, what really hurt my feelings is when the, uh, the papers here came out and said that a lot of our shows didn't have quality. In fact, the Herald said the Monitor Channel shows weren't up to the high quality of television. <laughs> the high quality of television. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I guess uh, there's something that could be, uh, 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 could be said by, you know, uh, God forbid that a bad show should be on television. I really wouldn't want that to happen on my watch. Isn't that phenomenal? Yeah, it's phenomenal. Well, listen, you know, when people try to dishonor you, they only uh, dishonor themselves. We're still here. We'll be here for you. And uh, I'd like to give you a couple of inspirational uh, words at the end about America. Do you have trouble with all this? I mean, getting through it? I don't know what to make of any of this. 
uh, the, uh, the constant mediocrity, the lack of humor among the candidates, the fact that they have no humor about themselves or about uh, the American dilemma, that the spin doctors sit with them and say, well, the people will buy that. Well, what do they know? Well, they're only uh, auto workers in Flint or they're only farmers in Iowa. I see all this stuff in the Times, in the Washington Post. Why do they have this contempt for us? Why, why are the American people the most lied to people in history? I mean, we've got a hell of a track record of being good to other people. And, and people loving us for it. And, you know, it, uh, it really is remarkable to me, but I think I might have a fix on it. You know, the last thing that Thomas Wolfe, and I always like the American writers, I like Walt Whitman. You remember when uh, John Kennedy was sworn in, he had Robert Frost at the inaugural. I, uh, I imagine Bush will have uh, Rod McEwen at this one. <laughs> Bush, Bush's, uh, Bush's literary taste. I have promises to break <laughs> and miles to go before I sleep. So, you know what Wolf said about America? He said, I think America is lost, but I think she will be found. That's the last thing he ever wrote. That's a web in the rock, isn't it? And he said, uh, um, he said, I think she will be found. He said, the problem is blind compulsive greed. He looks like a member of the family, and he sits down with you at the dinner table, but he isn't. And blind compulsive greed is the enemy, and it'll, it'll destroy us. And he said, if you do not believe me, look about you and see what he has done. Thank you very much for coming, everybody.